be it without the gruesome death in battle part. <laughs> Dearest friend, how have you been since we last talked? I know things have been a little difficult of late, for both of us it seems, actually for many people. Thinking about how we're better trying to share and get through life's problems together made me consider writing this letter. So let me start again, this distant friendship found over books, poetry, life, and the grim garbage fire of social media. Let me do more to introduce myself to you, to open doors of possibility that we may discuss and explore together. It may feel as though you already know me well enough, but it occurred to me, how well can we ever know someone we've never actually met? As our meeting is still no more than an ethereal future, lost in the quantum mists of possibility, it seems to me that writing letters might add an additional dimension, a way to grow beyond the limitations of algorithmic control. As Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, the key to growth is the introduction of higher dimensions of consciousness into our awareness. So, may these letters be my introduction to higher dimensions of consciousness. May they open wide the solid oak doors to the great hall of our shared growth, so that we may dine on our thoughts together, like in the halls of Valhalla. Or be it without the gruesome death in battle part. As you know, I've been working on the new essays that will make up the second season of the podcast and video essays on YouTube. Your encouragement has been pivotal in getting me to do the work, to dig out every last morsel of insight, thought, and history I need to tell these stories. I now cannot deny that this work is being done entirely for you. These essays are my dedication to you, my dearest faraway friend. Because how else can I give a gift to express what you mean to me when you are so far away? I must create something that can be shared in a place that you can find it, see it, and know that it is for you. Yet, yeah, because it's for you, I want it to be perfect. And so it's taking longer than anticipated. Another reason I decided to write these letters. At least they may fill in the time before my true gift arrives. You may now be wondering what you can do in return 
what you can provide to me to match or meet my own expressions and adoration. So let me reassure you that there is nothing required of you. Because our friendship is not a barren capitalist realm of exchange and transaction. There is nothing more required of you than being my friend, the friend you are already. My gifts to you are the rudimentary, flawed and failing desperations of a distant man who wants you to know that you matter. A lover may have sent roses, a family member might provide a parcel of food. I send thoughts and queries. The vain machinations of a fellow lost soul seeking the fulfillment found in being lost in this world together. As Francis Farmer said, I have learned that to have a good friend is the purest of all gifts, for it is a love that has no exchange of payment. The essays are not the only thing I've been working on, of course. I've also been working on poetry, I had this rather pretentious idea to write a collection of villanelles that would act like a kind of love letter to my city. I know, me having a pretentious idea. What a surprise. Yet, I began to realise that what I was coming up with just didn't fit that mould. For a start, they weren't villanelles. Instead, the poems are all going in quite a different direction. Some of it is still inspired by the city and the ever-present history that lingers and lives here, like the slow-beating sandstone heart that was mined for the walls. Yet I have to admit that much of it is me filing through past emotional experiences that I've not quite healed from yet. Although there's much more I could tell you, now isn't really the time. Suffice to say, today I'm aiming to write a new poem that I hope to share with this letter. So if you find a poem at the end, you'll know I succeeded. You should see the weather here recently. I know, it may seem strange to you if I talk about the weather when you live in a place that only really sees variability with the seasons. But it is now September, and the often variable weather here is starting to edge towards pure chaos. There is little telling what might come. The other day, on the last day of August in fact, the sun was out in a blazing display of summer exuberance. Then it was chilly, with fog so thick I couldn't see across the green outside my apartment building. I'd like to tell you that this is unusual for Edinburgh, but alas, it's quite normal. If there is one piece of advice I would encourage you to absolutely adhere to, should you ever come to visit, it's that you wear plenty of layers that can be easily removed and replaced. Still. There is an undeniable beauty to this place, even in the mists and rain, perhaps especially in the mists and rain. I find Edinburgh to hold a strange melancholy romanticism. A romanticism of what could have been, not nostalgia exactly, but of holding out for the not quite requited love. The love of the one that won't have you? but also can't let you go. I don't know. Does that make sense to you? In the end, I guess part of the reason I love this city as much as I do is because of that edge case romanticism. The city speaks to my hopeless romantic soul. Yet, when you live here, there is much more to this city than the romantic history of old cobbled streets and glorious stone buildings. This is a living, breathing city, a place of people and life, a place that visitors are almost never privy to. 
The city that I'm truly in love with is not the city of ancient stone and grand visions. It's the city I actually live in. So I guess what I want to start telling you about is that city, as it's something of a metaphor for my own heart, a somewhat hardened shell enclosing a romantic core. That is probably the best way to further my endeavours here, to reach out to you and share who I am beyond our brief but wonderful online interactions. For a start, as a writer living in this city, I cannot deny the importance and significance to me that Edinburgh was the first UNESCO city of literature. An accolade that isn't at all surprising when you consider how the written word seeps out of every crevice and hunkers in every close of this city. I think there are more libraries in this city than any other place of comparable size I've ever been to. Public libraries, university libraries, specialist libraries, and of course, the Scottish National Library. This is particularly important to me because the places I go to write are mostly libraries. Sometimes I'll go to a cafe, something else Edinburgh has an extensive collection of, along with bookshops. The best is a combination of these two, a bookshop with cafe. There are a number of those around Edinburgh, and this week I went to one of the most impressive toppings near Piccadilly Place. I'm sure you'd like this one. It's quite large, and almost labyrinthine in layout, meaning you can quite easily just get lost in the towering shelves of books, rather than having a cafe area. Toppings has gone for small tables and chairs dotted around the store like the detritus of an Edwardian doll's house. There you can sit with your tea or coffee, cake, and a book. I'm not sure it's my favourite, but it's definitely one of my highest ranked places. Most of the time, I don't actually like working in cafes. It can make me feel guilty because I might be there for quite a while and I'm likely not buying as much as the people buying something, leaving, and being replaced by new people who will buy something. Of course, that isn't true for all cafes. There are some that make efforts to actually attract folk like us and set aside a little corner. I like to call them poet's corners. After the tradition in Scottish and Irish pubs. These are particularly good when they supply a wing-back chair. So props to Room and Rumours for that one. There are so many things around Edinburgh I wish I could take you to. So many things I'm sure you would enjoy as much as I do. I'll do my best to tell you about them. But it's not really the same as being here. It's especially not the same as being there with someone who knows it well and is impassioned about it. Not the same as experiencing a place for yourself. Is there anywhere in particular you'd like me to tell you about? I'd like to know more about where you live. The places and things you love and enjoy there. Perhaps you could write back to tell me about your life and where you live. Before I go, I'd like to tell you that I've been reading a small collection of John Keats' narrative poems, Lamia, Isabella, The Eve of St. Agnes, and other poems. I got it from the Scottish Poetry Library in the Old Town. Of course, I've long enjoyed the works of Keats and others from the Romantics movement, something I know we share, of course. I'm sure you've probably already read them, but just in case you haven't, I'd really recommend you do. Also, I recently read the new Kathleen Jamie book, Cairn, which is a collection of short anecdotes, thoughts and poetry that is a little out of the norm for her, 
but a delightful read that's easy to just dip in and out of. Until next time, though, I look forward to talking to you again. Your ever-adoring, far-away friend, James. James.